expected. Uh, as I already said it, uh, infectious diseases were the leading cause of death. So we had a lot of causes. The main cause was streptococcus suis infections, uh, either causing meningitis, meningocephalitis, uh, polyarthritis. And although even some cases also had pericarditis, endocarditis, and polycerositis, which are not so common to see associated with the, this bacterium. And it was a link to severe outbreaks in many of the farms. So the disease was diagnosed in 14 out of the 18 farms. And some farms, uh, we observed mortalities uh, reaching up to 19%. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me for this week's episode is Dr. Fernanda Perosa. Dr. Perosa is a PhD candidate in veterinary sciences at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Dr. Perosa, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. If you would, why don't you give everybody an introduction? Hello, Dr. Johnson. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here today talking about our study. My name is Fernanda Perosa. I am a DVM by the Federal Institute of Santa Catarina State, Brazil. I got my master's degree from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul State, also Brazil, where I'm currently a PhD candidate. Since my undergrad years, I've been very interested about the veterinary pathology, mainly the diagnosis of disease in livestock, such as swine and ruminants. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boring or Ingelheim representative to learn more. Excellent. Well, Fernanda, you're here because you've recently uh, worked on a really interesting necropsy survey, and there's nothing near and dear, more near and dear to my heart uh, than research that involves a big necropsy survey. Uh, as my good friend Aaron Lauer often says, your diagnostic or your your uh, necropsy knife is your best diagnostic tool a lot of times in finishing. So, talk to us, Fernanda. Um, you've done a big project. Talk to us a little bit about um, the background for the necropsy survey and what all you learned. So this was this was a project that we conducted during the year of 2022, aiming to assess the main causes of death in nursery piglets from southern Brazil. So the south comprises over 70% of the slaughter at swine in the country, with Santa Catarina State, where we conducted this study, having the, swine, the largest swine herd in Brazil. So during 2022, we visited 18 different nursery farms across the state of Santa Catarina. These farms housed from 1,200 to 47,000 piglets. We stayed during five days in each farm. And during this period, we necropsied every piglet that died or was euthanized by farm staff. So based on the presumptive diagnosis, that we made through the microscopic examination, we collected samples for ancillary exams, such as PCR or microbiological exams, or even feed samples for bromatological analysis. Uh, tissue samples from all the piglets necropsied were collected uh, for pathological examination. And also some cases were submitted for immunohistochemistry analysis. Then we established the diagnosis for, of the cause of death for each piglet based on the association of the macroscopic and histological uh, findings uh, and associated with the results in the other exams when performing. We then also conduct a simple statistical analysis to assess the, mor- the mean mortality rates in these farms and to see the frequent distribution of each disease according to the age of the piglet when they diet. So this was how we conducted this study. Excellent. Um, talk to us a little bit, if you would, Fernanda, about assigning the cause of death. You said you use kind of all the different data points to assign each mortality's cause of death, but admittedly, that's pretty complicated. What were the rules of thumb or the decision trees that you went down? How did you standardize that process to remove some of the inherent bias that can be there, the subjectivity of it? Yeah, so it was basically uh, through the macroscopic and histological finds. So infectious diseases are 
the leading cause of death in nursery piglets. So this disease is frequently have very established uh, pattern of lesions. So we studied this, this pattern of lesions, uh, either the macroscopic and the histological examinations. And although some different agents can cause the same lesions, then we conducted like PCR or microbiological analysis to aiming to determine which bacterial or vi virus was associated with that cause. Excellent. Yep. And with uh, with no PERS and no PED, that probably makes it a little bit straightforward and less complicated. Yes, yes. Well, tell us uh, what you learned. What sort of information did you glean from the study? So during this study, we necropsed 557 piglets and we achieved a conclusive diagnosis in 90% of the cases. And as we expected, uh, as I already said it, uh, infectious disease were the leading cause of death. So we had a lot of causes. The main cause was a streptococcus suis infection, uh, either causing meningitis, meningocephalitis, uh, polyarthritis. And although even some cases also had pericarditis, endocarditis, and polycerositis, which are not so common to see associated with the, this bacterium. And it was a link to severe outbreaks in many of the farms. So the disease was diagnosed in 14 out of the 18 farms. And some farms, uh, we observed mortalities uh, reaching up to 19%. And this was mainly associated with serotype 9, strapped to Swiss serotype 9, because in the year, in previous years, uh, in Santa Catarina State, in neighboring states, had been severe outbreaks of death uh, related to the serotype 9, so we could also diagnose in our farms. And other common infectious diseases I observed were, were bacterial polycerositis, mainly linked to Glossarella parasuis. We, and for our surprise, the third main cause of death was a group that we call a chronic atrophic enteritis that were characterized by piglets with severe wasting, loss of body conditions. They were very thin, very emaciated. And they had a histological lesions consisting of intestinal villi atrophy. So as we could not identify the agent because the lesions were already in a very chronic stage, doing uh, throughout the epidemiological investigation, the, the, these farms reported to us that their farrowing units had been recurrent cases of rotavirus infection in their suckling piglets. So throughout this study, we could also see that an infection by rotavirus during the suckling phase should be considered as a potential cause of this disease that we observe it in the nursery phase. So it's very important for us to associate epidemiological and clinical signs, not only for the phase, but when the, the animals were previously also in the, in the suckling phase. And other infectious diseases were also very important, like salmonellosis, uh, colibacillosis, and viral and bacterial pneumonias. Very good. What uh, time of year did you conduct this study? What were the months? And do you think seasonality would have an impact on your results? Would it be good for this, these producers to look at this at a different time of year? We conducted throughout the whole year. So the year. So there was some farms that we visited in March, April. Some were in November. We really wish that we could do a study regarding the the season, how it impacts in the disease, but in the moment we were not able to because we only had one year to trying to collect samples from the higher number of farms we could during the period. So we we were not able to see if there were some difference according to the uh, month of the year or, or the season, unfortunately. Very good. Well, what about um, applying the results? Were the farms uh, surprised by any of this data? Were they able to use the information to dial in maybe their vaccine protocols? You mentioned, you know, strep serotype 9 and some glasserella isolates. Uh, were they able to build any autogenous vaccine or, or kind of customize their medication programs at all? Yes. Uh, some of the farms where there were cases of streptosuis and glasserella parasuis, they, they started to uh, by uh, autogenous vaccines uh, aiming to prevent or to control the disease. Uh, also, there was a form that there were some error management in uh, porcine sarcovirus type 2, and they started to like correct their vaccination protocols. 
So some farms actually, uh, they they saw what we diagnosed it, they understood, and they put in action some measurements to control the diseases. Fernanda, based on your experience, if you were a pig producer, how often would you want to do this sort of survey? Do you think this is something that has value to do to do ongoing, or do you think that you'll learn some information if you do it for a few months, and it's probably not going to, the results aren't going to change for a while, so you can wait a few years? How frequent do you think you would need to do something like this? As a pathologist, I would say to always perform. All the time? It's a quick exam. If you, you only need a knife in formal formal to put the the samples so then you can submit to send it to a stopatological lab so i always recommend because you can have great insights uh in many uh even clinical or subclinical diseases so i think it's very important very good study, uh, very interesting information and very applicable. I'm, I'm very glad to hear the producers were able to use it to improve their uh, their programs to manage those diseases. Fernanda, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know it's been something that's been really valuable for the audience. I would like to thank you once again. It, it was a great opportunity and I hope everybody can enjoy it and go and see our study. It has great images in it. It's very illustrative. Uh, we have images of for the main disease diagnose it and it helps a lot to to uh, diagnose the conditions. Well, I hope the, the producers keep sending you tissues so you can keep putting this sort of information out. You'll have to come back and give us an update sometime. Um, and Fernando, we can... We couldn't do this without the audience, so thank you to the audience for being a part of this. Um, you've been listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. If you haven't checked out our website, please do so at www.swinehealthblackbelt.com. For Dr. Ferran- Fernanda Perosa, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for spending this time with us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.